Hey, welcome to Medical Stuff. My name is Mark. I really don't want to be here, Frank. And this is Chris. You said you would be here, so get here, you jerk, Fingston. And I do want to be here. <laughs> well, I really, I like being here. So we're batting 500, which is good. And if yeah. this was Major League Baseball, we'd be making a ton of money. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show my nerdiness here in the sense that um, you don't know what baseball is. No, I know I know what baseball <laughs> is. I understand that batting a thousand would be hitting everything your way. Right. Um, but I couldn't tell you is 500 good or not. It's great. Yeah, five, so 500 yes. would be fantastic. So yeah, yeah, I mean, a 300 is considered high end. Well, here, let's do this. Because uh, if we talk about it that way, like, my high school grades were phenomenal. Because <laughs> you're batting 500, right? <laughs> yeah. Some A's, some F's, you never know. Uh, batting average, major league. So, anyway, this evening, while we're looking this up, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, Ty Cobb, whose career ended in 1928, has the highest batting average in the Major League Baseball in 1928. Wow. And that was a .366. Jesus. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> Over 24 seasons. Gotcha. Wow. Uh, and he won a record 11 batting titles. Damn. So batting 500 apparently is, on a long-term basis, impossible. Okay, yeah, sounds good. So, yeah. So I was impossibly good at high school. Exactly. <laughs> I was impossibly good. <laughs> lots of highs, lots of lows, but they evened out to a nice C. Could you send the agenda back to my phone again through the text? No, you said you had it. You <clears throat> could pull it up on your computer. Oh, yeah, but, you know. It we just have to start so over. I just sent No, it. we don't have no, to start I sent over. you an email. And well, you download it from Google Docs. Did it? Yeah. Did you? I did. You probably did. Hey, man, I show up to this thing, okay? <laughs> Who wants to be here now? I made the agenda. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? Oh, God, it's right there. It, 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 hey, you see, it's my email, man, just like I told you. <laughs> just like I told you. Um, anyway, yeah, but we're talking about uh, heart shit, right? Or heart stuff, right? Yes, this would be a cardiac one. So we're going to go over some basic anatomy. We're going to cover some uh, some rhythms. You know, snare, snare, hi-hat, snare, snare, hi-hat, that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's start out with basic anatomy of the heart. All right. So now a couple episodes ago, I think we uh, we traced a drop of blood through the heart. Yeah. And, well, well, through the entire body, but now we're going to get a little more a specific. Like a, a smaller drop of blood specific? Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. One single cell, <laughs> <laughs> which can end really quickly, depending on the heart. You could be like, and one pump, and it gets lodged in the chordae tendine of the uh, valve. Right. Yes. And done. <laughs> right. Thank you for listening to medical pump. No, just kidding. So anyway, uh, you have a drop of blood that's coming up to the heart. You're coming up through the either the superior inferior vena cava. Yeah. And, and those are two big pipes that come from the rest of the body to dump mm -hmm. everything back in. So, and that blood gets dumped into the... Uh, it's going to be the right atrium. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So it goes down through the. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, it goes. It goes down through the. Um, is that the mitral valve on that side? I think it's the uh, bicuspid valve on that. side. It is the bicuspid. Well, no, but that would be the mitral because it looks like a little miter hat. And then it's yes. tricuspid on the other side. So, yes. it, so it is mitral. So mitral okay. Valve. Yep. Down into the right ventricle. ventricle. Now the thing is, the atrium are basically there to fill the ventricles. Yeah. And the ventricles are what actually push the blood around the body. Atrium are, are on top of the heart. I don't know if we mentioned that. Right. Yeah. So the atrium are two chambers that sit on top. Then the are ventricles. they on top? Considering the bottom part is the apex? Now you're just fucking with anyone trying to keep track. <laughs> <laughs> Irrelevant. Uh, if you look at it in real time, yes, they are on the top part of the heart. Uh, so blood comes from the superior inferior vena cava through the atrium, through the bicuspid valve, into the ventricles, and then it goes through the pulmonic valve. So your entire circulatory system has valves, and the purpose of the valves are to keep blood from backflowing yeah. backwards through the system. Got to keep it going one way. Which, <clears throat> this is most important in your extremities. Yeah. In fact, your, uh, your veins have valves. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> This is why people tune in for this now, kind was, of groundbreaking I going, information. I was going somewhere with it, but I think I might start talking about that a little bit later. Okay. Just talking about the structure of veins and arteries. Right. You know. So <clears throat> the valves are there to keep things from backflowing. You go through the pulmonic valve out into the pulmonary system, which would be the respiratory. Right. It would be your lungs. Yep. They come back in through uh, the... So After that getting some artery... Oxygen. So an artery is any, or is any, any tubing that is going away from the heart. So the blood vessel. Whatever. Mm -hmm. I drew a blank on that. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, so the pulmonary uh, the pulmonary artery is unique 
it the is. sense that the blood going from the pulmonary, from the right ventricle to the lungs, the pulmonary artery, is deoxygenated. The only artery in the body. Absolutely. And every other artery in your body has oxygenated blood. In it. Exactly. It's going out. Come through the lungs, and you come back from the pulmonary, you come back on the pulmonary vein, which is unique because of why? It has oxygenated blood. And the best part about this is how nerdy Mark and I are about this. We're both <laughs> grinning at each other because we know what's about to happen. It's like watching two geeks watch Star Wars exactly. right before Luke Skywalker gets his hand cut off. What? You know, we're like, it's going to happen. Oh, Dude, sorry, did it. spoiler alert, man. It's Return of the Jedi. <laughs> that hey, hey, some 80s. people will not have seen it. <laughs> so, anyway. So, once it comes back, it comes into the left atrium. And then goes, in fact, I think this is one we talked with about your dad, and we completely messed this up, and we had to re-record it, if I remember correctly. No, I don't think we re-record. Well, we cut out the part where we went and looked it up, but it was one of the few times <laughs> where we turned out that I was right. I remember this. It's like, no, I kept I the recording. I that. Yeah, no, I you don't. I remember that. Probably blocked it out for so, a good few days in a row. <laughs> uh, so we're in, the right, uh, we're in the left atrium. We come down through the tricuspid valve, and basically the bicuspid valve has two flaps. Mm -hmm. That's bicuspid, and the tricuspid valve has three flaps. You know what, Mark? They say you're not smart. I, I disagree. Yeah. Look at That's that. That's actually the only thing I know. So uh, we come down into the left ventricle, which is going to pump the blood through the entire body. Mm -hmm. Now, once you leave there, you go out through the aortic uh, valve into mm -hmm. the aorta, and directly off of the aorta are what? That'd be the coronary arteries, Mark. Yes, they would. Yeah, now, the are, they, are they an stuff. active artery or a passive artery? They'd be a passive artery, Mark. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you will now, not what get does a... passive artery mean? What's a passive versus an active well, artery? Well, the pressure is done passively as opposed to the rest of your arteries where you have an actual pulsatile feel. Yeah. You will not get a pulse going through the heart. It's just they're backfilling from the pressure. The arteries usually have muscle in them that squeeze. And right. that's how you get blood pushed around your body, except squeezies, in that squeezies. one case. Yeah. Squeezies. Yes. <laughs> Pretty squeezy. <laughs> so that brings us kind of to our next point. Now that we've kind of gotten the uh, that out of the way, that bullshit done. Yeah, exactly. Basic anatomy. <clears throat> I put this on the agenda as basic anatomy as best as you can say on an audio format. <laughs> this really works a lot better with pictures. So the coronary arteries—they are the smallest arteries in your body. Yeah. Yes. And the reason people have heart attacks at a greater rate than, say, a clot in your arm or leg is because of their size. Right. That you can't get through. So what a heart attack is is where the blood has been cut off to a certain section of the heart. Yeah, and there's a few reasons uh, that that can happen, but uh, the main one we're going to be discussing today is going to be clots. Right. There are also coronary spasms. Right, or uh, angina, where you can get... Angina is basically chest pain, and then there are some times where those uh, arteries just like to shut. Sometimes for reason, sometimes for no good reason. Oh, uh, yeah. With a lot of time with your angina, uh, you have a plaque buildup on the inside of the arteries. Yep. Which is can lead to a heart attack because a clot gets caught on that plaque. With angina, basically, it's narrowed the arteries to the point that it can't open up wide enough to uh, handle the demand of the heart. Yep. So if you get up and you're moving around, you're doing something, your arteries get bigger so they can let more blood through, and they just can't get big enough in the coronary arteries, and that's what causes the chest pain. Yeah. So, Which is why, by the way, if you experience chest pain, call 911. Exactly. Because that's a big deal. We want your heart to work effectively. Although, interestingly enough, uh, chest pain, that, that doesn't always present as chest pain in everybody. Or sometimes it's chest pain with other pain as well. Common symptom is also pain in your chest or pain or pressure in your chest. A uh, heaviness. Yeah, a heaviness. It then radiates up to your jaw or your arm, either right. arm. Left arm is more typical from what I understand, but, but it could it be can either. Go both ways or both, uh, either way or both. Yeah, and if I understand correctly too, uh, females kind of get the short end of the stick here in the sense that females can present, uh, more commonly present atypically than men. In other words, they'll have back pain associated as well. Or no pain. Or no pain, exactly. Just proving that women are mysterious creatures that we do not understand. Absolutely. And that somehow they managed to get the shit out of the stick biologically again. And I'm sorry if that seems sexist at all, but you guys, you have periods to deal with. We don't. You they have, you have to, a you have to a birth child. a baby. We don't. You know, granted, you get to create life, but you still have to carry that thing for nine months, which is highly uncomfortable. Absolutely. Well, it looks that way anyway, I will tell you. And then on top of that, you get weird presentations for heart attacks. Absolutely. So I do, I, I feel I would talk guilty. to your manufacturer about this. This <laughs> seems like a recall time, kind of Absolutely. notice. Absolutely. Um, but just don't give us pregnancy. You guys are doing great. No, no, no. I'm not saying that. I think that women have the handle. What I'm saying is maybe a little upgrade on the heart, you know. At least. Yeah. Hey, we have to deal with this. How about we get better heart attacks? Absolutely. 
<laughs> that was just as messed up as I heard it in my own head, too, now I think it through. No, no, it's solid, though. We'll <clears throat> stick with it. <clears throat> so, we'll come back to heart attacks in here in just a little bit. Right now, I think that we can talk about some of the other diseases that can be associated with the heart. Yeah, how about uh, CHF? Congestive heart failure, is that what you're talking about? No, I was actually going with corporate hedge funds. Those can cause chest pain if they go over the wrong <laughs> way, i got to tell you. So, congestive heart failure. So, what is congestive heart failure, Chris? Come on, roll, lay it on me. Lay it on thick. Oh, easy peasy. Um, so, let's start with a little bit uh, just kind of about how your cardiovascular system works. So, your heart's a pump, plain and simple. Mm-hmm. It pumps blood around, okay? And um, the fluid that it pumps around is your blood. Now, sometimes things can happen to your heart. Uh, you, know, you have a heart attack at some point that you survive uh, that can cause the heart to fail. It doesn't pump as efficiently. And what that causes is instead of efficiently moving blood around your body, uh, the blood doesn't move as well and it creates congestion. And depending on what part of your heart is failing, that manifests in different ways. So what are some of the different ways you can get congestive heart failure? One is you just mentioned was a heart attack heart that attack. does damage to it. Yeah. Uh, another thing too is uh, what they'd call hypertrophy. Mm-hmm. That's an enlarged heart where basically it's the, the heart's so big that when it goes to contract, it doesn't contract completely, not being an efficient pump, correct? What can cause that? Um, I want to bring up something specific, though. Okay, because, go for it. Uh, high blood pressure. This is oh, why yeah. it's so important over long term to make sure your blood pressure is under control. Because what's it called? What's the elastic band analogy term? Starling's principle. Yeah. Starling was a genius. Yeah. Uh, basically, what Starling says is that... Um, Harder you push out, the harder it pushes in, right? I mean, that's well. As you make your heart work that hard, the muscle becomes less elastic. <clears throat> so, if you take a rubber band and you put it between two points and stretch it out and keep it there for long enough, basically that band, that rubber band is going to lose its elasticity. Yeah. So the difference is with the heart is by making it work so hard, basically the muscle loses its, its contractility. It just cannot pump as hard, causing the same endpoint as a heart attack. Gotcha. So, what do we call the amount of blood that uh, is pumped during a, a heartbeat? That'd be an ejection fraction. A normal ejection fraction for people in their 40s is about 70%. Okay. So, it's not uncommon. Then, if you have atrial fibrillation, which what? is atrial fibrillation. Gotcha. Did you not hear me? Or you just want it's to not like you say said it again? A defibrillation. <clears throat> That's no, what I that's thought. That's what I you end up with after a heart attack. <laughs> was, you get a defibrillation. I was going to say, I mean, I imagine if you've been defibrillated, I mean, <laughs> CHF is probably on the docket somewhere right. in life. No, atrial fibrillation, uh, which we can, we're can we going to go into here in just a little bit. But this can also decre- decrease your uh, ejection fraction. Now, what happens is as your ejection fraction goes down, your congestive heart failure, your ability to get and go up and do things mm-hmm. goes down dramatically. Yeah. So, um, congestive heart failure, should you talk about right-sided versus left-sided? Sure. Yeah. So, I'll talk about right-sided. I'll start there. You do that, man. You yeah. own it. You own it. So, a little bit earlier, uh, we talked about the uh, anatomy of the heart. That's important now. So, when we started off, the right side of the heart is going to be receiving the blood from the rest of the body. It's the inferior and superior vena cava, two big veins uh, coming back in. And if you have right-sided heart failure, in other words, maybe you had a heart attack on the right side, which causes the right ventricle to not pump as efficiently, or it's enlarged from chronic hypertension like Mark was talking about, um, what this will cause is because the blood in the right ventricle is not being efficiently pushed out, you get congestion. And that congestion starts to back the blood up through the rest of the system, and it starts to kind of push its way back out or rather not come in as efficiently from the rest of the body. And what you'll start seeing is you'll see uh, most commonly is uh, swelling in the extremities, particularly the lower extremities and the feet and the legs. Um, you know, many people will probably have relatives where mm-hmm. they know it's like, oh yeah, you know, uh, you know, G-Ma's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, G-Ma's feet are swollen again. And you'll actually get what we call pitting edema. It's basically because where you look at someone's... Pits. It is the pits. <laughs> uh, it's where you look at someone's foot and you'll see, uh, or actually, I guess, any extremity that's edematous. And well, they, it, look, they look... We say the feet because it generally goes to the lowest part of the body. Absolutely. Which but is can, generally the feet. Yeah. Now, if they're in some sort of inversion thing, it'll be their head. Their head will get absolutely huge. Or... Uh, or <laughs> <laughs> That doesn't actually happen. I was going to go more of the serious route. <laughs> Bed can find patients. You'll right. see them. Uh, you'll see that that up higher. Right. Um, but yeah, you'll actually be able to get, it's pitting edema. You can actually take your finger and push it into someone's foot. And then when you remove your finger, there will be a pit 
mm-hmm. just sits there for a bit until the uh, fluid kind of pushes it back out. But yeah, it's called yeah. pitting edema. And that is one way um, that uh, congestive heart failure uh, can manifest. This also takes its toll, though, on some of your internal organs uh, as well, not being able to um, expel waste blood products as mm-hmm. easily or circulate. Well, because you're just not getting the circulation yeah. that you should. There are some recent studies that uh, are still, these are studies taken with a grain of salt. They need to be repeated with larger volumes, but they're starting to look at um, liver failure in patients who have uh, CHF who didn't already present with some pre-existing liver failure, who hmm. get liver, liver failure after CHF. And they believe that has something to do with the return of blood being inhibited. Right. Yeah. So uh, the left side. So left side heart failure is... It's essentially the same endpoint with a little more drama, I think. So the most common cause of right-sided heart failure is left-sided heart failure. Oh. <laughs> because that's where... So left-sided heart failure generally becomes more pronounced more quickly. Why? The left side of the... The left ventricle, left side of the heart, does most of the work in the body. In fact, even looking at the heart itself, the left side is just bigger. Right. It's just this because, big muscular yeah, pocket. Yeah, the right ventricle, you know, it's just pushing blood <laughs> through the lungs. He's that the poser left ventricle at the gym. that, you know, is the big, is the true deal. Yeah. I mean, this guy represents, or woman, yeah. represents. Well, if you think about it, it's got to push a drop of blood, I mean, from here to your, to the smallest toe in your body. And back. Yeah, and back again. Right. Versus the right's just got to go, well, you know, like a foot. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So... Left side heart failure, you've had, you've done some sort of damage. We mentioned the di- different types of, some of the different types of damages before. The problem is, is that once you get that backflow at this point, the left side of the heart is pumping less blood than the right side of the heart. And so you're getting more blood pumped into your lungs than your body can pump back out. So not only do you get the pitting edema, the, you know, the, uh, lowest extremity edema, you start getting what's called, uh, congestive heart failure, and the fact that blood is actually backing up into the lungs. Yeah. And you will sound like, you'll hear somebody doing this, and they sound almost like an old percolating coffee pot. Mm-hmm. Or blowing water, blowing air through milk. You can hear this from the door. Yes. And yeah, it's bad. Can. And if it gets bad enough, they will start to... Fulminate. Fulminate. Yes. Have you ever seen fulminating? I have seen. I've seen... That's... You know, I've actually been in it, uh... Got my paramedic eight years ago. Really? Yeah. God, you're old. I know. I've been yeah. at um, I've been in our agency now for thirteen. You're really old. I know. How long have you been at it? What? <laughs> Any. You pick a number. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're all bigger than what I just said. Uh, I've been with the company seventeen years, and I've been an EMT or, or paramedic for twenty four years. Gotcha. I'll be twenty five years this year. Well, wow. congratulations! Yeah, by quarter, the way, yeah, quarter century. Yeah. I'm going to try and play the the company we work for. When you work for the company for twenty five years, they will actually buy you a Rolex. Are you going to try and play that up? Yeah, I'm going to try. Hey, I've been a, a paramedic for twenty five years. Doesn't yeah. that count for some? Mark, I just I want like a Fitbit. You. In fact, I will say <laughs> I love you. And again, there you I mean. go. I just want the new Fitbit. I'm not saying it has to be Rolex. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> just uh, I'd like a fit, but anyway, <clears throat> back to congestive heart failure. So you start getting blood filling up into the lungs. At some point, you will start fulminating. So fulminating is where a pink frothy sputum is actually coming out of the mouth, and it's fountaining or fulminating out of the mouth. Yeah, <clears throat> this is bad. Very bad. Very very bad. Because you're not breathing through that. Right. Yeah, you're not getting any oxygen. These exchange. are generally patients who are probably going to be ending ending up intubating or dead. Right. Uh, the, Legitimately, if you get to that point, the chance of you dying has gone up dramatically. Yeah. In in fact, uh, <clears throat> the last person... It's been a while since I've seen fulmination. In fact, I don't think I've seen it as a supervisor. I think the last fulminating patient I had, I was a field training uh, field trainer, and that guy coded on us, and he never mm-hmm. came back. Uh, the last patient I had, we actually made it to the ER. Yeah. So what can we do for this? Well, we uh, nitroglycerin, because yep. nitroglycerin will make all of... So nitroglycerin is... The, the definitive, in this instance, short-term fix. This is the Band-Aid on the wound. Yes. Because what we're basically doing is we're relieving the back pressure temporarily. I would almost liken it to like a piece of tape on a dam that's right. cracking. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, you know, this put it there. <laughs> Hans Christian Andersen sticking, you know, the child sticking the finger in the dike. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yes, it's going to work, but for how long? Yeah. So, so, yeah, so we make all of the arteries and the veins bigger. That allows the back pressure to relieve which should allow the fluid level in the lungs to go down. Yeah, I mean, if you think of, if you think of the lungs as any other, you know, pressure system, you've got pressure, uh, you know, from the lung, from the environment inside the lungs versus pressure inside the, uh, 
uh, arteries feeding the lungs. And, uh, well, veins f- uh, come going from the lungs, I suppose. I like blood vessels. Blood vessels. There you go. <laughs> Asshole. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, blood, uh, the blood ve- vessels uh, in the lungs. And if the pressure in the blood vessels is greater than what's inside the lungs, that's where the that's where the fluid's going to flow. And so, if we make those blood vessels bigger, it's going to reduce that pressure, allow fluid to come All back right. in. Uh, another drug we have to help with this is Lasix, yeah. which is more of a long longer term fix. Mm-hmm. But the basically what that's going to do is make them pee off fluid. Yep. So that then they have a less amount of fluid. In fact, CHFers. Sorry, congestive heart failure patients uh, generally are on a fluid restriction daily. They can only have so many cc's of fluid every day to keep this from happening. And the only issue with Lasix, though, is that it's non-potassium sparing, so it pees out potassium with it. And for heart patients, that can't—that's not always the greatest. And so right. uh, Lasix got when I started, we were giving you well, know, hun- yeah, hundred plus milligram doses we used of Lasix. To give, uh, when I started here, I don't know if it was like this when you did. <clears throat> we doubled the daily dose. That's 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 what I walked into, yeah. Yeah, so that's if we I had a patient into. taking 80 milligrams, mm-hmm. we would give 160 milligrams of Lasix, and we could repeat that on the way to the hospital, yeah. which it takes Lasix a while to work. Yeah. It can be upwards of 45 minutes or so. <laughs> so that didn't really bother us, but, man, the hospitals were not happy at yeah. that point because this person starts just peeing. The, but the problem is, though, with that much Lasix, you go too far the other way. Right. And the patient cannot become dehydrated. And you're pulling off all that potassium, which the heart needs. And that can cause the heart to do some pretty wonky rhythms. Nice technical term there. Yeah. Yes. Pound that. Yeah. That's what school's for. I use that on the radio all the time. We got a patient with a heart in their wonky rhythm. They're like, <laughs> oh my God, go, go three. Yeah. Gosh. How do we resolve wonkularity? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and well, so the big change in the last probably five to 10 years yeah. has been CPAP. Yeah. CPAP is so what CPAP does. Uh, you can probably know somebody who's on a CPAP at night for sleep apnea. Absolutely, it holds the airway open, but it provides a pressure. Yeah. Before CPAP, when the intubation. I worked, yeah, yeah, we did nasal intubations. Oh, oh, did, okay, gotcha. Yeah, because the patient's conscious. Yeah. And so we would actually take an intubation tube, which is a breathing tube that goes down into your trachea, and we would go up the left. I'm sorry, go up the left nair. Did you guys have RSI? We did not. No, because we didn't need it because we did nasal intubation, so that's back at you. We didn't have to have medications to do the job for us. Anyway. Um, you were too scared to use them. <laughs> uh, so it would go up the nair, up the left nair, back down the back of the throat, and we'd try and get it into the lungs from there. And although it's essentially doing the same thing in theory as the um, CPAP, CPAP mm-hmm. it is a much more invasive and much more dangerous thing to do at that point. And it's hard to get a patient off of that once they're on it. Right. To wean someone yeah. off of a tube. So basically what we're doing is both of them are using positive pressure to force that fluid back into the bloodstream. CPAP, by the way, stands for continuous po- continuous positive airway pressure. Right? Wow. What? Wow. What? Airway? Continuous positive. Air pressure. Air pressure? I don't think it makes a difference, actually. Okay, I gotcha. I mean, the, the <laughs> wow, I, I, thought, I thought you were like, no, actually, it's catatonic pulmonotic. Uh, <laughs> Maybe like, for you unlearned types, it's continuous positive <laughs> air pressure. No, but so basically, it's just a, a, a continuous air pressure that's greater than what's in the bloodstream, mm-hmm. pushing the fluid back into the uh, yeah. blood vessels and lungs. So <laughs> it works well, though. It does work very well in the right circumstances. Yeah. Now, if the patient's able to tolerate, one of the problems is... They have to be conscious, one. <clears throat> for one, they have to have a blood pressure where they can sit up. Yep. For two. And C, the problem is... Two, and then C. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times these patients are kind of claustrophobic. They're working really hard. Uh, fairly brand new medic back when I was starting in Oklahoma. We oh, walked in on a... C- Oklahoma. Where uh, I walk in on a congestive goes. heart failure pa- patient, and we've got the patient on a non-rebreather, and they keep going, I need air. I need air. And um, I'm going, man, we have you on air. We have you on the max. So I'm doing, getting an IV. She keeps telling me she needs air. I'm considering intubating this lady. Mm-hmm. My partner goes, Mark. Now, he said it very sternly. Mm-hmm. Maybe because he said my name a couple times, and I had not paid attention to him, and he had to get my attention. Could be. And I go, yeah. And he goes, you're in front of her fan. <laughs> so she had a stand fan right in front of her, just blowing directly on her because she's working so hard yeah. that she's building up all this heat. And I went, oh, and I moved out of the way. And she was like, oh, that's better. <laughs> yeah. That, so, that cooler <laughs> sensation is yeah. a lot to these people. Uh, yeah, a ton. So putting these a people. CPAP mask 
on them is very confining because it's a tight fitting mask. It goes over the mouth and the nose. It's warm. It's warm because they're breathing into it. Mm. And so that can be a problem. Yeah. But if you can get it on somebody and start giving them the relief, the relief they feel from it will generally outweigh the discomfort they feel from it. Yeah. Now, did you know, because nope. you're talking about a, a, probably not, yeah. Uh, you're I'll Google about the, it, though. They have to have a, a blood pressure uh, requirement. Do you know why that blood pressure requirement's there? I think you're going to tell me, Chris. I think I am. So this, I actually ran into this because we had a patient where we walked in, uh, one of the local fire agencies was actually doing a really good job. Um, I say it like it's uncommon. It's not uncommon, but... Um, Actions and words, Chris. Actions and words. <laughs> no, we have a lot of very good partners out there. Yeah, and they were doing a great job. They get in there and they're like, hey... Um, you know, this is a CHF patient. She's full. It, I can hear it walking in. Right. Like, we're putting her on CPAP. We're getting a blood pressure right now. And the blood pressure came back in the 70s. Right. So they immediately stopped the CPAP. And uh, we went to, um, we ended up having to beg her. She coded on the way in. We actually got her back. And you know how we find out we save her? Hmm. Her son called to complain about us losing her cell phone. <laughs> the, best You're welcome, is, sir. the best part is, the best part is, he called me because I'm the supervisor. The nice. next day. And I'm like, wait, what's your name? I'm like, hey, your mom's alive? And, <laughs> and he's like, yeah, she's in the hospital right now. Or no, she was at uh, one of the local um, uh, uh, son on, of a. Come on, come on. <laughs> one of the local uh, rehab words. units. Oh, okay. Yeah. The next of, day? Uh, no, it wasn't the next day. It's probably a few days ago. Okay. Uh, a few days after. Like, yeah, no, she's in there. She's going to be there for, for a couple weeks. I'm like, oh, gosh, yeah, because she. I start kind of explaining because I'm like, maybe he doesn't know. And he's, but he does. And he's just like, yeah, 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 yeah. We're just trying to find the phone. I'm like, I don't know where her phone is, dude. We didn't take it. <laughs> we weren't sitting there being like, hmm, she's dying. She's going to want that iPhone. Exactly. You know, like it's, uh, oh, it's an iPhone X. Don't leave home without that. Exactly. You know? uh, but anyway, by the way, this isn't sponsored by iPhone Anybody, at no. all. No. Um, although, but if, if you're listening, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're not saying no. Yeah. We're yeah. just saying not yet. <clears throat> Let's go with that. So anyway, um, anyway, and so um, so we get to the hospital, and their immediate thing is, why'd you take her off CPAP? And the RN that we're talking to is convinced that that's why she coded. And the problem with this a lot of times, when someone has congestive heart failure, their heart's failing. And when their heart fails, not only can you have fluid that backs up to the lungs, as is her case, it can also fail to push blood anywhere else in the body, causing a dramatic decrease in blood pressure, which is what we were sawing, uh, sawing seeing. And you're rocking it tonight. I, I know. And of course, the RN's concern was, well, what's the difference between bagging somebody or putting them on BiPAP? Because we're going to BiPAP right now. I'm like, well, the difference is, and luckily, I just had this explained to me by our physician. <laughs> The problem with continuous pressure is that it increases the inner thoracic pressure. And so when you have a heart that's already having a lot of trouble expanding. And you put the external pressure on it from the lungs. Continuous pressure is going to make them fail worse. BiPAP or bagging them is different because that's pressure relief. Release. Pressure right. relief. You actually could make a case for the fact that you're helping the heart at that point. Right. Because it's giving extra compression than releasing it. Yeah. And so I don't that. Know how accurate that is, but you could make that argument. Uh, well, we're going to make it today. <laughs> Some physician out there is face palming the shit out of himself right now. Just... Who are these two Nimrods? And close. <laughs> and unsubscribe. <laughs> Long as it's not our medical director, we're okay. Absolutely. You know. Dr. Sonny, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> he's actually on a few podcasts. Have you heard him? Talk about I have not. Yeah, have he's, not. he's a joy to listen to. Oh, okay. Okay, so congestive heart failure. Moving on. So I believe we touched on PEs. We possibly touched on them in the respiratory, maybe? Yeah, briefly, though. Briefly. I don't think we really want to. So PE. What is a PE? Is a pulmonary embolus or emboli if you have more than one. I'm actually fairly certain we did because I just thought of trying to make a joke about physical education. Unto which I'm certain I did the same thing last time. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, that sounds like something you would do. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it was bad, whatever it was. I don't think it was a so good joke. So, pulmonary embolus. So, when we were talking about clots earlier, <clears throat> so pulmonary embolus is a clot. Yeah. But instead of a clot in your coronary arteries, it is a clot in your lungs. Just as bad long term. And it can be more than one. And they yeah. can be very really large. What would you know? Huh? I have had PEs, jerk. I know. <laughs> I've had, I had pulmonary emboli because I had more than one. Gotcha. Is that like a flock I, of emboli? Assuming, yeah, exactly. <laughs> flock of emboli. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I call them. So, anyway, what happens is this will restrict blood flow through parts of your lungs. Yeah. 
And you can actually infarct or de- cause the muscle to die or the lung to die in a part of your lung. Uh, I found this out when I had my PE. So, uh, what causes this? Well, a lot of things can cause it. Uh, one of the most, the most common things they look at are recent inactivity. Right. Such as long flights. This is why they recommend if you're going to be on a long flight for more than a couple of hours that you get up and walk around at some point. Or sitting in an ambulance for 12 hours. Right. So get up and walk around every once in a while on the ambulance so that you can, uh, or if your bed can find, a lot of times this can happen after knee surgeries or mm-hmm. leg surgeries of some form where you can't get up and walk. Also, uh, surgeries themselves can cause clots. Yes. You know, because as your body's healing and the clot comes off of an internal stitch or something like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So if they get large enough, because what will happen is as that restricts, it can actually collect more and more and grow. There's a very nasty looking video on YouTube of them remo- removing a huge PE and they pull it out. And this thing's got to be like six inches long. Jeez. It was amazing and disgusting all at the same time. Was this like a, like in the morgue? Like a. No, no, no. This was an active surgery for a patient who was nice. alive. Yeah. Hey. <clears throat> like I said, guy. it was a, it was amazing and disgusting all at the same time. Yeah. Because it pulled it out. So there was a little bit of wow and then a lot of. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of gagging noises and. And then you're not in grape jelly on. for a week. Exactly. Um, so <clears throat> pulmonary embolus, so they can t- remove them surgically if need be. Yeah. If they do get large enough, they can kill you. And the hard part for us in the field is there's not a ton we can really do about it. There's not a, a not a ton that we can do to really diagnose it without yeah. just having experience of running across it before. It's not like a heart attack where we can run a 12 lead and get definitive. Yeah. You know, get a definitive airway. But, <laughs> so I have a few. There are a few things. I mean, I don't want. That don't want to do Let's just leave it. It irritates. That term irritates Chris. So I like to throw it out there every once in a while because it catches him off. So, <laughs> I mean, it's no black ice, but you oh, know. Oh Jesus! All right, I'm talking about black <laughs> no, ice. No, no, no. I'm talking about this black ice. About cardiac. This I have cardiac. one message to everyone out there who's driving. <laughs> I'm not saying black ice does not exist. I am saying this: if you are the only. Mother effer. Hey, 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 hey. Say, okay. If you are the only person, <laughs> if you are the only vehicle operator to lose control on a patch of ice on a busy street, and everyone else seems to get through it just fine, don't tell the emergency responders it was probably black ice, because it probably wasn't. You well, probably just weren't paying attention, because here's the fact, all ice is the color of whatever the hell is underneath it, because ice is clear. And now you know why I say these things. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, pulmonary embolus are a couple different ways to take care of them. The most common is uh, anticoagulants. Right. I really wanted to say anti-clots, but no. <laughs> anticoagulants well, are basically blood thinners. I mean, you wouldn't be wrong. <clears throat> the most common of which is probably Coumadin or Warfarin. Same thing. That's the rat uh, poison. The new... <laughs> it, it can is. be used as rat poison. Because what happens is, why is it used as rat poison, Chris? Well, basically because rats cut themselves a lot, so you just make it to where they can't clot off. And so right. the next time they get the minor, some minor cut, either internally or right, externally, externally, then they bleed just out. bleed out. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's not poison. Nothing is poison if you take it in the right dose. Right. So what they're basically doing is they're using the blood thinner to break down the clot. A lot of times when they do this, they will put you on heparin, which is a shorter acting blood thinner and clot buster. And the reason they do that is because until you get to a therapeutic level on Coumadin, it is actually a procoagulant. Oh, really? Yes. I didn't know that. Did not know that. That's that when I went on Coumadin. <laughs> oh, gotcha. All right. Yeah. They, uh, so see with the heparin, isn't this overkill? This yeah. is why you have to go get tested regular. At least that's what my doctor tells me. Um, and what do they know? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, to make sure that you're within a therapeutic range uh, between two and three. INR? Is that what they're Yes, the I-N-R. INR. And so if you're below that... You can become procoagulative. Is that a real word? It sounds it sounds like a political position, actually. <laughs> I'm procoagulative. I like coming up with words that sound real enough that nobody's really willing to call you out on them, but makes them gotcha. pause and think about See, it. See, I feel like I'm a moderate coagulative. <laughs> I feel like Such that's a middle of the road coagulative. Yeah. So anyway, um, it can be procoagulative, and then if you're too high above that three level, then your blood's too thin. One of the problems of that is if you fall or injure yourself, you can bleed out much more easily. Or if you happen to have a weak part of your artery, you can actually have a hemorrhage. And if that's in your brain, it's called an aneurysm or a hemorrhagic stroke, and it can kill you. 
Well, while we're talking about uh, cardiac stuff and uh, blood thinners, I want to touch on aspirin really quick. So you probably it's pretty common knowledge that uh, aspirin is good for your heart and that kind of stuff, or at least that's what it's being uh, – it's one of the things we've been doing for a while. You look like you have something on the tip of your tongue. No, I'm good. Okay. Um, but Go aspirin on. is technically not a blood thinner. A lot of people believe it's an anticoagulant, and it's not. It's what you'd call an antiplatelet aggregator. So when you have clots, and the reasons, one of the reasons that we give aspirin in the field, uh, and then one of the reasons that people take an aspirin a day, uh, is that when you have a clot that's formed, what aspirin is supposed to do is prevent additional platelets in the blood from building that clot up bigger. It makes them slippery, so they don't stick and they just kind of move on. Sure. What you got? Nothing. I'm good. I'm just sitting over here waiting, waiting for you, man. Was so, that unnecessary? PEs. No, 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 no. I just... Anyway, moving on. PEs. We can talk about this later. <laughs> Personal opinion. Not based in any sort of fact. Just me. Okay. So, anyway. So, yeah. This is how you're going to treat your... Uh, you're going to be on heparin until they can get you up to a therapeutic level of Coumadin. Now, I asked my doctor after I got out of the hospital. I'm like, do I need to go back and get another CT to make sure this is working? He goes... No, basically, if you're feeling better, it's working. No, there you go. <laughs> so, yes, this is, I mean, it's a very serious, it is more of a longer term thing, but it can become just as serious as a heart attack or a stroke or something along those lines. Okay. So, those are pulmonary emboli, right? Yeah. So, okay, so when we come out and we talk to you, or we see you in the field, or you go to a doctor, you go to the emergency room, they're going to put a, a cardiac monitor on you. Yeah. So, initially, they're going to put you on a three-lead, mm -hmm. which is three stickers with cables attached to them. That's a four-lead. If you put four leads, it's a four-lead. Lord, Chris, keep up, man. Technically, you can get more than four leads out of that. Because you can get the money. You want to do this part? Sure. You want to do this part? Apparently, I need to. You want to do this part? <laughs> you can get the MCLs. Uh, so, standard is a three-lead. Yeah. So, you're going to be... On the right arm, the left arm, and the left lower extremity. Now, they will generally put these on your chest, uh, not across a bony prominence. But it leg legitimately, and I have done it, you could do this wrist and ankle. Yeah. Um, they were built to work on the anywhere on the arm, anywhere on the leg. The point is, is that you want to get them to try and be as symmetrical as possible. So that if you're going to put a fourth lead on or more, which we'll get to in just a second, they need to be symmetrical. And what a lead is, is that when you're applying an EKG, so an EKG is just a measurement of electricity in the heart. Right. That's what it shows. It doesn't actually show, it doesn't show a pulse. No. You know, contrary to popular belief. It just shows electrical activity, and it's just a measurement of amplitude over time. And EKGs are one of the main reasons my daughter won't let me watch medical shows while she's home. Oh, God, no. I, I can't <laughs> even, pictures are ruined when, right. when, when you live with a paramedic. Oh, God. You know. I was watching a movie. It was uh, I, Frankenstein. Please don't sue us for this conversation. Gotcha. Um, they're working on reviving a rat. I believe it was a small animal. I believe it was a rat. And they have these uh, screens in front of them that are translucent. They're holograms, right? And they're showing the EKG and stuff like that. And this guy's sitting there and he goes, he's in V-fib. And I'm like, no, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> that is clearly a sign of rhythm. He's you know? actually doing okay, man. He may not have a pulse with it, yeah. but he's not a V-fib. Don't shock him. Right. No, stop. Right. <laughs> no. <laughs> and they were shocking him, and they were at uh, 150 joules, and I can't go any higher than that. Sure you can. Actually, you can, because uh, in the old monophasic monitors, we started at 200 joules anyway. That was a yeah. get-go. Well, you top off at 360, I right. think, correct? Exactly. Yeah. But the problem was that you had to turn around once every time you shocked him, so you got a full 360. <laughs> and you looked at me funny for talking about aspirin. Uh, so, so uh, what were we just? Oh yeah, so three leads. Yeah, so the three EKG. Lead, well, I was gonna say three lead is a monitoring lead. Yeah, you can look at one angle at a time from three different angles. Well, that's what these leads are. If you think of them like camera angles, uh, it's just looking at the heart from a different direction, which can show you different things about different sides of the heart. Right. Which leads us to our next point, which is a twelve lead. Right. Now they also have. 15 leads, 18 leads, and 21 leads. What are the difference? Uh, it's the side of the chest they're on. So a uh, 12 lead is you have your basic three leads. Yep. Then you have electrodes that go across your sternum and down underneath your left breast. Yeah. A 15 lead goes under the right breast. An 18 lead is on the left side on the back. Gotcha. That and makes a 21 sense. 21 lead is the same thing on the right side. Gotcha. So as you put more leads on, you become 
much more exact on what you're looking at. The standard is 12 lead. It's kind of one of those things that's like, this This is fine. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you want to get really specific, you can do those other things, and you can get very, very specific. But for what we're doing, we don't need that kind of specificity. Absolutely. What we're looking for is, is someone having, um, we're looking for an indication of a heart attack or not. That's, right. what we're, that's what we're looking for. Now, given it's not, an EKG is not the only indicator of a heart attack, but it's a big one. Well, what are we looking for on the 12 lead? We're looking for elevation of a certain segment. Which shows the, what? It shows infarct. It shows damage being done to the heart. So Absolutely. Actually, when so you're right, it doesn't show infarct. Right. It shows damage being done. Yeah. Right. So basically what we're talking about, we're talking about what's called an MI. A lot of people commonly call a heart attack. MI stands for myocardial infarction. Now, the fun part about medical terminology is it sounds like you're really smart when you say it. Mm -hmm. And it's legitimately a bunch of small words put together to make a big word. Yeah, they actually have a class called medical terminology. Right. And for it's anyone considering medical... term. <laughs> oh, well, but I, I will tell you this. For anyone considering the medical field, take that class as soon as you can. Right. You can pass a litany of tests just by knowing a little bit of Latin. Right. Like, that's... So, you have uh, myocardial, heart, muscle. Yeah. Myo, fibromyalgia. Heart is fi muscle fiber pain. Mm -hmm. uh, myocardial infarction is heart muscle death. And MI, a heart attack. So what you're looking at in the 12 lead is a deviation of the electrical conductivity going through the heart because it's having to go around a damaged portion of that heart. Now, it's important to note, though, that you could have the infarct occurring, which causes the pain, but as long as that electrical deviance hasn't happened yet, it may not show anything on the 12 lead. This is why you, uh, if you have suspicions, you should do serial 12 leads. Yeah. Which are generally about five minutes apart. And I've actually had those patients that you start seeing the ST elevation yeah. happening as you're going. And that's when you drive faster to the hospital. Absolutely. And it's also one of those things, too, that, and this is kind of one of the uh, things that I see in newer paramedics is they really rely on that 12 lead a lot, and they sort of forego the rest of the patient presentation. They treat the monitor, not the patient. Absolutely, because here's the thing. You might only be five minutes away from the hospital. So if you do a initial 12 lead and nothing's showing, but you have a patient who's you know in their 50s, they have all the risk factors, they're sweaty, their pressure maybe isn't that good, and they have this crushing chest pain, and they have all the symptoms, yeah. go ahead and... Go ahead and go lights and sirens. Right. Treat it like it is. Because here's the worst thing that can happen. You can get there and a the doctor can be like, yeah, yeah it's, it's not a STEMI. No, it's STEMI. Yeah, it's not a heart attack. Or you can get there and be like, hey, good catch. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's I mean, it's very easy to treat the monitor, not the patient. So, now, before we said that a three lead was one angle at a time from three different angles, mm -hmm. a 12 lead is 12 different angles at one time. Absolutely. And so, not only can it tell you if there is a heart attack, it will give you a good indication of where in the heart it is. Which is important because that can affect your treatment. Absolutely. For example, nitroglycerin. Right. We talked about that earlier. It uh, dilates the blood vessels really well, which helps blood uh, circulate circulate around better. However, in certain types of heart attacks, that can actually cause a dramatic drop in blood pressure. Precipitous, even. Ooh. Um, mm -hmm. uh, to the point of of uh, causing harm to the patient. Right. It can actually crash their blood pressure to the point where they lose a pulse. Yeah. Which now, is bad. Of, they, that's what they told me in primary school. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> now, we can also, we have to be careful with, especially this day and age, erectile dysfunction medications because they can cause the same thing when combined with nitroglycerin. I got to digress into a story that is funny. No. You'll love it, though. No. So the other day, I have a chest pain patient. No. And, yeah, I know. It's actually a really common call. Uh, but uh, we're sitting there, and we ended up actually outing him cheating on his wife in front of his wife. Whoops. Yeah. Uh, so I'm so going his chest pain went up at that point. <laughs> right. So we're sitting there and I'm about to give him nitroglycerin. Glycerin. I'm going over his medication list. He just got done telling us how he and some buddies were at Lake Tahoe about two weeks ago. Um, just him and his buddies. And his wife's like, yeah, I'm so happy when he got back. That kind of stuff. And so we're going through. I'm like, oh, hey, I see you're on Cialis. When was the last time you had your Cialis? About two weeks ago. I did not catch Awkward on. Awkward silence. His wife became immediately angry. I didn't initially catch it. Hard right. to believe I know until later on. We're, we're hard to believe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, later on. we are medical professionals. Stop doubting us. That's yeah, hard to believe. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, so we're uh, we're driving to the hospital, and it dawns on me halfway through. Oh, <laughs> oh, because I'm giving a report on the radio. And I'm thinking of everything he's told me at this right. point, and all of a sudden, like, 
That's why his wife got really quiet and kind of angry. Because <laughs> the last time this guy took his boner pills right, was on when vacation. He was not with her. So. Yeah. So uh, anyway. So unless he was really bored in his room alone one night. Which is plausible. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So uh, anyway, I just had to tell that story. So yes, yeah, so the erectile dysfunction medications can potentiate with nitroglycerin causing, again, that precipitous drop in blood pressure. Yeah. I actually had that happen. We had a patient who had taken uh, Viagra 18 hours earlier. No, this was pre-you, man. Oh, really? Yeah. Because you and I had one where uh, they gave the nitro and then you asked. Right. And then the patient was like, yes, I am on Viagra. Yeah. <laughs> and they about pooped themselves right there. Mm-hmm. He did uh, fine. But... Yeah. So uh, I called and talked to a doc because it was within 24 hours. I was supposed to call and talk to a doctor. Mm-hmm. And uh, the doctor's like, man, it should be fine. Hmm. Let me talk to another doctor real quick. And, and this is one of the things about like about the hospitals that we transport to is that they're willing to, they, they know something, and that thing is that they don't know everything. Yeah. You know, and so they're That's willing. That's important in this job. It's very important in this job. And so he's like, yeah, yeah, I, I asked around, we should be fine. Great. Start, uh, start a line on this guy. All he get was 20 gauge. It was 18 hours earlier. We picked him up at midnight. So that means he took it at 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, somebody at the hospital asked why he was taking it at 6 o'clock in the morning if he lives alone. And my partner's response was, well, there's really not much on TV at that time of the morning. <laughs> And so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we gave him the nitro, and almost immediately he started head bobbing, coming in and out of consciousness. I asked him, you know, can you lay, can you move to the gurney? Yeah, yeah. We pick him up, we get him onto the gurney, get his feet up. We start running our IV wide open through a 20 gauge, yeah, well. which is more of a fluid suggestion than a fluid <laughs> challenge at that point. Um, we did not get a pressure on him. He woke up when we laid him down. That's good. Uh, we could not get a pressure on him until we arrived at the hospital after 500 cc's of fluid, and that was 72. Damn. Yeah. We rolled into the uh, emergency room, uh, made report, everything like that. We cleared. We got another call an hour or so later. Mm-hmm. This is a night shift. Came back, dropped off that patient. Physician I spoke to on the phone came and, you know, hey, 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 can I talk to you real quick, Mark? Yeah. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> whatever. About whatever. I was like, no, there's no reason to be. You know, I said, uh, you know, none of us. Oh, that was good. Right in the middle of the podcast. Way yeah. to go, Chris. Do what I can. Exactly. So, yeah, I was like, nobody expected this to happen, you know. And so, yeah. So, this is the things that we have to worry about in these situations. And this is why patients need to be honest with their paramedics. Yes, Maybe not to the point of admitting that it was two weeks ago when you took it last. Right. Yeah. And well, your wife, well, you know, right. in an existential form, it's good that his wife found out about this. Very true. You know, yeah. I like to think I was doing their relationship a favor. Exactly. <laughs> Letting everyone know where they stand, getting it out there. <laughs> so once you uh, do have a heart attack and you're taken to the hospital. So if we have an ST elevation myocardial infarction, this is a STEMI. Chris, mm-hmm. Chris mentioned that earlier. So... The ST elevation is part of the EKG. Yeah, there's it's a little the S wave to the T wave. Yeah, and that starts moving up the S wave. Now, if you've ever seen a, a cardiac rhythm, you have a little bump, you have a big spiky, and then a bigger bump behind it. Mm-hmm. Generally, so the little bump is called the P wave. The big spiky is called a QRS, and then the big bump after is called the T wave. And this is the electrical conductivity moving through the heart. So, an ST elevation would be a raising between the S wave and the T wave. Yeah, it's basically that big spike and the little bump afterward, or in the bigger bump afterwards, right. doesn't go down as far. In exactly. Between. Doesn't return to the baseline. Right. So, this is a STEMI. We're going to go to the hospital. These <coughs> days, we can, especially in our system, we can transmit that 12 lead on ahead so the cardiologist can look at it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we're good at cardiologists. Or we're good at cardiology as paramedics. We're not cardiologists. No, we're not. No. So they can give them a lot of information. And there will be times when you don't even take the patient off your gurney. You go straight to the cath lab on your ambulance gurney Mm -hmm. because they're waiting for you at the door and they're ready to go. Now, generally, these people are signing the consent form on the way up in the elevator. Absolutely. You know, and so what they're going to do is they're going to go to the cath lab and they're going to run a wire from the groin artery, the femoral artery, or they can actually start doing it in certain certain circumstances now in the radial artery. Oh, really? Yes, they can go cool. on that. And it's much quicker recovery time for the patient because it's a small artery. Good. They will run all the way up into the heart where the infarct is happening. And this is where that 12 liter, 15 liter, whatever comes in handy because they know where to go. Right. And they will actually 
break up the blockage and place a stint, mm -hmm. which is a wire mesh that they insert through the opening that's there, and they use to press all of the plaque and everything up against the art up against the artery. So you open up that artery again, getting blood through to it. It's cribbing. It's, it's framework. framework. Yes. Cribbing. Now the problem is, is that uh, you can break some plaque loose, which then can create a bigger issue somewhere else down the line. So there's mm -hmm. always dangers with this, mm -hmm. but. Your heart's dying, so I guess really the other dangers at that point yeah. <laughs> may seem a little less uh, important at that point. You know, it's not a 100% chance it's going to happen. And they're going to use medications uh, like Lovenox, which is a... Blood thinner? Blood platelet aggregator. That's correct, Chris. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so Antiplatelet aggregator. Antiplatelet aggregator. I guess you want a platelet aggregator. Yeah. <laughs> <at that point. laughs> the opposing thing of what we We really want to make this a challenge for you, so we're going to raise a degree <laughs> of difficulty on this. You're going to earn your, your, uh, your <laughs> yonder years. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah, they're going to be an antiplatelet aggregator to make sure that those you don't have a, re, a re-infarct. And you're actually have a higher chance of re-infarcting during how long? For six weeks. Way to go, Chris. <laughs> For six weeks after a stint placement, you actually have a ch higher chance of rehabbing it. I literally hour. just yawned at him and shrugged. <laughs> exactly. Just like, oh. um, then the other option is if they can't do a stint. That'd be a uh, bypass. Or a? Cabbage. There you go. Why is it called a cabbage? Coronary artery bypass. There you go. Graft. There you go. You, go, yeah, you really stumbled across yeah. the line on that one. Well, and, uh, what they're doing there is they're literally, they're taking a blood vessel from elsewhere in the body and they're slapping it on your heart. It's, it's a... I guess you it's could a say it's a bypass. <laughs> exactly. Think yeah. about like your local city where you have a bypass artery uh, for a highway. This is the alternate route to the traffic jam. Mm -hmm. That's what this is. They typically take, I believe, from the Great Saphenous Vein, mm -hmm. which is a long... Oh, the pretty good Saphenous Vein. <laughs> Great an oversell. <laughs> That's the when long... the Saphenous Vein is doing its own PR. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, just a, uh, that's, just, and that's just a long spindly vein that runs down your leg. Mm-hmm. Yep, they'll take a section of that, they'll attach it to and go around the blockage. Yeah, simple as that. Yeah. Uh, cabbages, though, when you're talking about, I mean, when you're a paramedic, hearing that someone has a history of stents or a cabbage right. are both red flags. Oh, yeah. Uh, however, my understanding, though, is that when you're talking cabbages, these are clots that were large enough to where the stent isn't going to work. Right. That's a more significant history than someone who has a stent. In fact, a lot of people will get stents placed. Uh, prior to even having, just because someone's had a stent doesn't mean they've had a heart attack. Right. There are people who will get stents placed after a stress test. My mommy. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, go to dinner with my parents. Have a very nice dinner <clears> at their house. <throat> Wonderful conversation. I'm leaving. My dad goes, say something. Oh, well. What's going on, mom? Oh, nothing really. Okay. What's going on? Well, we were going for a hike out at Lacamas Lake. You've been around Lacamas Lake, yes. right? You go yeah. around across the dam. Mm -hmm. And then you have that monster hill to get up. A damn hill. Right. Um, well, she got about halfway up that, and she was she couldn't catch her breath, and she was sweating really bad, and there's a bench about halfway up, thank God. And she sat down, and she felt better, but she felt really bad. She had, like, pressure in her chest. And I'm like, okay, this is not a walking out the door to my car conversation, gang. This is right. a call me when it happens kind of, because this is two or three days later. Yeah. Right? So I'm like... Okay, so what did you do? She's like, well, we decided not to continue on the walk that way. We went back down the Her hill, choice. back to the car, right? Like, has this happened again since then? She said, no. I said, you need to contact your doctor in the morning. And if anything like this happens between now and when you contact him, you call 911. Don't call me first. Call 911. Get an ambulance started. Yeah. Because it sounds like you're on the verge of having a heart attack, right? So she calls the doctor, goes and sees the doctor the next day. Doctor does a 12 lead, says, okay, we're going to take you over to a cardiologist, right? Okay, so when your doctor sets you up for an appointment, it can take a while. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a message on their phone, uh, on their voicemail when they got home mm -hmm. from the cardiologist's office. Say, hey, I'd like to get you in tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Right? He also sent them home with nitroglycerin and said the same thing. If anything like this happens, take a nitro, call 911. Yeah. She goes in and she does her stress test the next day. Generally, the interpretation of this can take two or three days. You know, the cardiologist gets to it. They have a voicemail when they get home <laughs> <laughs> from the cardiologist. So they left the office and they drove home. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And they have a voicemail saying, hey, can you give us a call back? And the following Monday, she went in for uh, angiogram. They found a 98% occlusion in the right anterior descending. I'm sorry, left anterior descending. 
the Widowmaker. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Widowmaker artery, because when you block this one out, it generally kills you because it feeds such a large part of the heart. It's a super highway to all the small roads, man. Yeah. Yep. So they put a stint in, and she's been doing fine ever since. Well, good. Good. And I got to tell you, I really paid up that, uh, played up that I saved your life thing when Christmas came around, because I wanted a really nice present. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy. Yeah. Remember, Remember when, I... when I saved your life? <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, those are the two. Uh, those are the two ways to fix a heart attack. So the problem is, is that we will get patients who don't want to believe they're having a heart attack. Often, often, like your mom, practically, actually, in that. I mean, she had right. chest pain she, and was probably ready to just shove it off. And actually, until your dad said say something, was ready to not say anything. Right. Yeah. Yes. So. Yeah. So, yeah, but we'll get patients who are reluctant to go to the hospital. Oh, no, no, I'm sure it's fine. Oh, no, no, I'm pretty sure you're having a heart attack. Yeah. Uh, I had a patient who the wife met us out front mm -hmm. a very long time ago. And she said, he doesn't know you're here. Oh. Right? It's a Sunday. I live in Oklahoma. And guess what they are really big on in Oklahoma on Sundays? Uh, okay, I'm going to say church or football. Well, he's watching football. Okay, I got so you. So we go in, and uh, literally Bible? this guy, I <laughs> wouldn't have doubted it. Uh, we This guy is literally saying they're rubbing the middle of his chest. <laughs> I'm like, there's a picture of you, my paramedic book, man. <laughs> right? So. Did NREMT <laughs> come down here and tell yeah. you. Uh, is this, am I on camera? You're an instructor is this, around a corner. Yeah, is this, yeah. Is this America's Funniest Home Videos or something? So anyway, uh, go in. Guy won't let me touch him. He's having a heart attack. I, I don't have to put him on a monitor. I have to get a 12 lead. I'm pretty sure this guy's having a heart attack right in front of me. So he will not let me. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Won't let me touch him. Wow. I said, okay. I sat down on the other end of the couch. I looked at the wife and said, hey, man, do you have something to drink, like some water or something? She goes, well, I could get you a Coke. I'm like, oh, that'd be great. Thank you. I sit there. I start watching the football game. I go, who's playing? And he tells me. And I sit there, and I can see him out of the corner of my eye. He keeps looking at me. <laughs> and my partner's looking at me like I've lost my pee pick in mind I gotta tell you and he finally must after, have been a new I, partner because I'd have been like meh it's Mark <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, so this guy after about 35 seconds you know 40 seconds goes what are you doing so I'm watching the game why are you sitting here watching the game uh, I don't know much in this life sir but I do know that you're having a heart attack right now and I know that you're going to go to the hospital today I figure within about the next 30, 45 minutes, your heart's going to stop, and we're going to do CPR on you, and we're going to shock you, we're going to give you drugs, and we're going to take you to the hospital. I hate other people having to do my work for me, so I figured I'd just hang out until it happened. <laughs> and he sat there and looked at me, and his wife came back with a Coke, and I said, so, you're going to the hospital today, I know that. Did you have any KG on him at this point? Or? No, he wouldn't let me touch him. Oh, gotcha. He wouldn't let me touch him. And we only, at that point, it's the early 90s, mid-90s, we only carried Life Pack 10s, which did not have 12 lead capability. Gotcha. So, back when paramedics were paramedics. So, um, <laughs> oh, I heard that in my own head. Don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, yeah, he's just sitting there staring at me. The wife walks back in, and I said, as she walks back, I said, so you're going to the hospital today. Oh. I just forgot to wait until right, you're ready to go. Fine. <laughs> Great. Jump up, put him on a three lead. You could see the ST elevation in lead two alone. And I want to point out something like uh, this, right? So we talked about the ST elevation. It actually resembles a tombstone. When it gets high enough, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's called tombstoning. Yeah. And uh, couldn't, couldn't be more aptly named. Right. Because, yeah, it may give you, it may kill you. So we dropped a lot. We jumped all over this guy. So we, you know, drop a line on him, start giving him nitro, call and get orders for morphine. Because morphine can decrease your uh, anxiety level, plus it is also a, a vascular dilator. Mm -hmm. So, and we uh, get him in the back of the rig and get the wife up front and we go code through the hospital. And this was back when stints were still... Gotcha. You know, and so it's probably going to be a cabbage, right? So, uh, yeah, this guy was having the big one right in front of me, but still because he wanted to sit there and watch football, you know, I found that... These days, people aren't as stubborn about it. They've gotten a lot better because I believe education and fear level has gone up tremendously in our culture. Right. With news. Very true. And I mean, I don't mean that necessarily in a negative way, but people are more apt to be like, oh, okay, yes, I've heard about this already. <laughs> maybe we need to go address this. I also don't wonder if maybe finally 
our reputation as professionals is maybe permeating oh, a little bit. You and me personally? Or no, 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 the okay. profession. Nice. Yeah, I think the paramedics have definitely uh, come up a little bit as being less ambulance drivers, although we still do get that term. Please do not say that to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, less ambulance drivers or transport. The one that we I get now a lot is, oh, transport's here. Where we're taking a patient home. Yeah. Uh, Look behind. Is there a cab driver exactly. back there? Is, there? is that a Broadway cab? <laughs> exactly. Driver? So, uh, also yeah. not sponsored by Broadway cabs. <laughs> and it's, after that comment, probably never will be. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah, that that's uh, some sponsor. basic cardiology for you. Yeah. Uh, if you want to know more, there are books out there you can read online or get online. But please, 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 please do not try to self-educate yourself to the point that you think you know more than your cardiologist. Absolutely. Uh, or your paramedic, really. Unless you are uh, one. That's a given. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, the doctors have the final say here. They have the education. They have the training. Mm-hmm. If your doctor seems fairly certain on something, trust them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Got to understand. These guys look at EKGs and hearts and patients day in, day out. One after another. They've seen all the bizarre scenarios, and they've seen them enough to know if you might be having one. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, don't... Self-education is good, but there are experts in this field for a reason. Yeah. I mean, even though you've listened to this podcast, that does put you up to almost a cardiologist. Right. Yeah, right You're below. You're almost there. Right below, like yeah. one, maybe two steps down. But still below. Right, exactly. You know? Maybe two steps if you really miss the part about Chris talking about black eyes. Right, absolutely. Yeah, that yeah. would probably, that's that extra step down, because that piece of information was definitely needed in a cardiology. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was needed. So anyway. You brought it up, you knew where it was going. <laughs> So anyway, my name's Mark. What's his name over here is Chris. Yep. And this is Medical Stuff. Thank you for listening. Adios. Toast. Toast. <laughs> you know, I really hope one of these days.